Good afternoon, Masa al khair, everyone. I'm just waiting to, uh, for some people, to more people to join. going to give it one more minute. Okay. And so I'll start with the language of Arabic. Masa al khair wa ahl musahlan. I'm named James Lynch, and I'm one of the directors of the Legal Society Fair Square. And we are Fair Square responsible for the project Vital Signs. الذي يركز على الظروف وخصوصا الصحة للأمال المهاجرين في الدول الخليجية من المهم لنا كمنظمة أوروبية وكمان المنظمة الأسيوية التي تشارك في هذا البروجكت إنه يوجد حوار مفتوح وعميق مع منظمة وخبراء في الخليج في الخليج ومن الخليج حول هؤلاء القضايا فنشكركم بحضوركم في في هذا الحوار الاول ونرحب بكم بالمشاركه الكامله في المناقشه حتى انه نتكلم بالانجليزي and I'll, and I'll switch into English now. Um, yeah, just to welcome everyone. F for us as Fair Square, you know, we 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 are we've been running with our partner organisations in in South and Southeast Asia, the Vital Science Project. Um, we're delighted to, to to be having this first discussion, and we want to 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 look at this more from a Gulf perspective than perhaps it is often um, seen. It's often seen as very much a, 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 an issue that people outside the Gulf talk about, um, the health. And the rights of migrant workers. So this is a really important first discussion for us to, ha to have. We're a European organization and that's why we, we, we want these discussions to be having happening with people who are really expert in the region. So really delighted to have such an expert panel. Um, we will I will introduce those panelists as we get to them. Um, firstly, we, 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 uh, I'll, I'll turn to my co-director in a second, Nick, if you want to turn your camera on. Um, who will just give a bit of background on what is the Vital Science Project. So what is what is our interest in this issue? Why are we um, holding this discussion? Um, and what have we found so far? Some of the kind of key themes that we're exploring. Um, uh, just a couple of admin points. This, this is being recorded and this will go online. Um, so uh, just to, so everybody's aware of that. Um, you can, we will be having a discussion um, towards the end of, 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 we'll have short presentations and then a discussion. So we really encourage people, please use the Q&A function. You can put questions in there. It, you can also request to be unmuted to raise a question if you'd like to do that verbally rather than, than writing it in the box. Uh, there is an anonymous option as well if you prefer that. Um, so yeah, please, um, please do so. We'd, we'd really like to have a, a good discussion uh, on these issues. Um, so Nick, um, over to you, uh, just to, to kind of um, kick us off. Um, thanks, James. And thank, thank you, everyone, for, for, for coming to, to the webinar. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to the, the genesis of this. Um, yeah, sorry, someone's on my balcony trying to move some stuff. Excuse me. Uh, the genesis of this was, uh, it comes from, I guess, work in Qatar, like a lot of uh, the attention on migrant workers' rights these days. It comes from from the, the 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 Qatar World Cup, and a few years ago there was a big discussion about World Cup deaths associated with uh, sorry Qatar deaths associated with the World Cup, 
And as, as an observer of this, it seemed that the entire uh, debate and conversation was dominated, dominated by numbers, how many are dying. And we didn't feel that that was a particularly helpful approach to this. And I remember doing a piece of work for Human Rights Watch, trying not to figure look at just deaths and numbers, but trying to figure out well, how are these workers dying and is negligence involved? And what are the various risks associated with all this work and how well or how badly are those risks mitigated? Um, Upon leaving Human Rights Watch, James and I set up Fair Square, um, but we wanted to continue doing this work. And having come from two big NGOs that work in the global north, you know, typically European organizations, we also wanted to do a piece of work that addressed not just a research gap, but an advocacy gap, which is to say we felt that, that the work on this issue should probably be dominated by and driven by um, organizations and individuals in the countries affected, predominantly affected by this, which is to say, typically South Asian countries, which are, are the origin countries for, um, for, for most of the migration, um, but also um, Gulf states themselves, where uh, you know, the, the countries that, that actually have the primary responsibility and, and the greatest degree of influence on this. So this is, yes, it was a, it's a re research um, project, but it's also very much an advocacy project very much trying to understand, you know, where the levers are for pressure to be applied to ensure that better protection um, can be provided to, to this very vulnerable subset of workers. Um, we've released one report to date, and we're about to release a, a, a subsequent report next November. Our first report was, was really, uh, in, in many senses, quite a general report. And we looked at the data that was available on migrant worker deaths, both in origin countries, um, embassies and such. Uh, we used freedom of information requests and also in, in the Gulf states themselves. And we found that the data was, was very patchy, was very inconsistent and, and, and quite incomplete in many cases. And it was very difficult to, to get a, a particularly accurate perspective and picture of what the problem was. The only thing you know is that there are a very, very large number of deaths and a very significant rate of those deaths are unexplained, which is to say that they have causes of death on, on death certificates that don't actually relate to any particular medical condition uh, or accident that caused them, things like natural death or, or cardiac arrest. So we looked at that data, which was very interesting, and then we wanted to put the data into the perspective of, or into the context rather of risks. And we looked at risks like heat and humidity, pollution, psychosocial stress, um, the inability of workers to access healthcare, um, and we put together this uh, this report um, with the aim of um, trying to engage governments in origin states and organisations in origin states to try and drive governments to to enact um, policies uh, and practices that would better protect these workers. Another gap, um, I don't want to talk too long. Another gap, of course, is is the Gulf. Um, you know, and, and our inability really to advocate very effectively on the Gulf on this issue. And there's not enough time to go into the detail on that. But one of the reasons for holding this webinar was really to try and um, engage um, with audiences in the Gulf. I think it's a, it is a, it is a criticism that is made often of, you know, Global North NGO work that we don't engage sufficiently um, with, with audiences and stakeholders affected. And I think it's a legitimate criticism in relation to the work on the Gulf. So I'm delighted to have um, three speakers today who can who can talk not just about the um, you know the thematic issues that we're dealing with here, uh, but also who can who can bring some Gulf perspectives to this issue that um, uh, that are so critical um, as we as we move forward on it. So I'll stop there and hand over to to the people who um, who can provide some of that insight and analysis. Thank you, Nick. Um... Great. So turning to our first sort of expert guest. Um, so Barak Al Ahmad is a research fellow at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He's also a mission scholar from the College of Public Health at Kuwait University. And he's got experience as a physician at the Directorate of Public Health um, at the Ministry of Health in Kuwait. Uh, his research looks at air quality, climate change and health in the Middle East, particularly the effect of dust storms and extreme temperatures. He's done extensive work on the adverse impact of environmental exposures on the health of migrant workers. So there could really be hardly anyone better to, to kick us off. Um, thank you, Barack, for your time and over to you. Sure, thank you so much, James, for, for this kind of introduction. Let me just share my slides here.
So the angle that I'm going to talk about today is just a, a slightly different than the usual um, human rights angle for when we talk about migrant workers, because I'm going to talk about climate change, heat, air pollution, and all the health vulnerabilities that come with these exposures, uh, especially in the Gulf region. But why climate change is important, because there are a lot of alarming projections. I put forward here for you four different peer-reviewed um, papers that discuss what sort of climate change projections we might have by the end of the century for the Gulf region. And you can see there are like big statements uh, from these uh, uh, papers saying that this could have an important consequences for human health and society. Another paper projected that there could be eight to 20 times higher mortality rate increase compared to the historical period. Others went and described this in different ways, saying that the climate change in the Arabian Gulf is likely to severely impact human habitability in the future. And just quite recently, another paper said that climate change is, is posing significant risks on human survivability in the Arabian Peninsula. So we've got a problem. Heat is a problem, and it is projected to increase in this particular part of the world. But the problem is that we sometimes tend to focus very narrowly and have this tunnel vision that heat causes uh, only heat stroke. So we, we start looking for um, all these kind of different things that the CDC outlined here. Oh, a heat exhaustion, a heat stroke. And if you, did you end up in the hospital because of heat? And what sort of cramps did you get? And, and all these symptoms and the neurological symptoms that you get from heat. So we tend to have this tunnel vision that heat causes heat stroke and the people die from heat. So when, when that happens uh, and, and a person dies, then you would uh, need to fill a death certificate, which is what uh, Nick was talking about. So in, in, you know, in writing it in a death certificate, there is one area in the death certificate that is the underlying or the primary cause of death. And surprise, surprise, physicians don't really write down heat stroke as the main cause of death. There could be other causes of death that resulted to this. So if you want to only look at heat stroke and death from heat stroke, you're not going to find much because it is rarely written in here. But the other problem is that heat can be a contributing factor if you have an existing comorbidity. So looking at this from a health perspective, from a clinical perspective, just away from heat stroke and away from that tunnel vision, heat can cause heart diseases, heart attacks, stroke, heart failure, arrhythmias. It can cause respiratory diseases. It can cause kidney diseases. There's a huge body of, of research looking at kidney diseases, diabetes, also mental health. Heat has an important part to play with this, along with many other reviews that look at the effects of heat. So we need to consider that. And then we looked at the heat effects on mortality in Kuwait, considering all different causes of death. And we did this in the Arabian uh, Peninsula, and we did this in a country um, that heat is really an, an, an important issue because we see temperatures of about like 50 uh, three degrees Celsius, for example, here in 2021. So in Kuwait, we compared extreme hot days to optimal temperature days, right? So these are the highest extremely hot days. And what's the mortality rate in, in these days compared to the optimal days where temperature is really good? So for the non-Kuwaitis, the migrant workers, we find twofold increase in the risk of mortality. And when we looked at the Kuwaiti population, we did not find an increase in risk of mortality. Same thing, dust storms, huge, huge problem in the Gulf, and it's a huge problem in Kuwait. We did this, we compared dust days, mortality rate versus non-dust days. Guess what? Same story. Non-Kuwaitis, 4% increase in the risk of mortality in dust days compared to non-dust days. For the Kuwaitis, we did not see significant increase in the risk of mortality. So we're tapping here into this health disparity that we're seeing between the migrants and, and, the, uh, and the Kuwaitis in Kuwait, and this is driven by uh, climate and environmental exposures. But the way, and I'll finish with this slide, the way that we, I, I like to look at this is that 
there are different domains that could contribute to the poor health of migrant workers and the vulnerability of migrant workers. So I, I personally tend to focus here on this part, the environment. I, I look at the extended exposure of outdoor air pollution or extreme heat or thermal comfort or you know, housing and infiltration of dust and water. But there are other parts of life that can wear down your health at the individual level. Lack of information, interpretation services, access to healthcare services, which uh, others in this panel are going to talk about. Uh, even at the community level, there are poorly maintained neighborhoods, overall community deprivation, cramped and hygienic houses by design, um, there's lack of recreational facilities, no physical activity options, no choices of uh, healthy food options. And then we get, of course, to the occupational domain, the kafala system, bullying at workplace, low pay, stress, long hours, no occupational safety and training, no provision of protective equipment, and well, of course, is uh, exposure to toxicants and chemicals. Uh, all workers are getting that. So consider all these things together. It is clear that migrant workers could have um, more vulnerable health compared to uh, other people with resources. So I'll stop here and then I'll look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Barack. <clears throat> uh, that was really fascinating, and I, and I, I really enjoyed you, you, the, the slide. I mean, a number of those slides, but I, I found it very interesting the point you made about the kind of cumulative factors there and all the different range of issues. Albeit, you know, there is a need for a strong focus on specific issues. Um, Barack, I just wanted to ask you one very specific question in terms of you know interventions that governments make to deal specifically with the issue of heat. Now, most I think all of the Gulf states have some kind of regulation that says, look, in the summer hours, it's a summer months between say June and September, certain hours of the day are prescribed for work. So you know between eleven and three, for example, there should be no work in exposed areas. I wanted to get your opinion on on how effective those are. You know, if if they're enforced, let's assume they're enforced properly. How effective are those at protecting workers from from heat stress? So at first, let's just. I'm not going to talk about how much of it is being enforced and to what level and to what extent, but let's just talk about it from a science point of view. So for the factors that contribute to heat stress are the temp you're exposed to, the humidity, the level of humidity, because if it's more muggy and humid, then you kind of feel it more, um, the, the air movement. So if there's a breeze of air, that would make it better. If the air is stagnant, that's going to make it worse. And then it's the solar uh, radiation. So are you in a shaded area or are you not in a shaded area? So these are four factors. But then there's also other factors. How much work are you putting at the time? That will determine your metabolic rate. That will determine also your heat exposure, right? And your heat stress. And then are you going to wear a lot of clothes? Are you a firefighter? If, if, if you're that, then your chances are going to be even more. So these are like, uh, or also if you're acclimatized or you're not acclimatized, is it your first day at work? Or have you been doing this kind of work for a long time? So just right off the top of my head, there are probably about eight different factors that could contribute in a very scientific way. Now, there are measures for your risk of heat stress. Guess what? The midday ban is a calendar base. It's just from 11 till 3 on these days of the year, don't do any work. But that is not based on any risk assessment. That is not based on any scientific assessment of what conditions are you exposed to. So does this mean come September 1st, you are less likely to get a heat wave uh, or, or you're less likely to get a heat stroke compared to, let's say, August 31st or August 30th? It, it, it seems arbitrary. And that sort of intervention is now across the entire region. But that, not to say that there, we've worked hard enough work on heat standards that follow certain metrics, like the wet bulb temperature or uh, things that could incorporate all these things. So we're also lagging 
in that part in terms of providing an alternative. Thank you. That's really interesting and helpful. Um, thank you so much, um, Barak. Um, so I'm now going to turn to um, Haranthi Jayawera. Um, Haranthi is a former senior researcher at the School of Anthropology um, and the and Center on Migration Policy and Society at the University of Oxford. She has a particular focus on migration and health. Um, and in 2015, she co-authored a report on Sri Lankan domestic workers access to health in the Gulf. Her work looks at governance frameworks around health in both origin and host countries. Uh, and she identifies discrepancies in healthcare provisions provision and barriers to its access across the migration process. So again, um, just a fantastic person to have um, to address these questions. Um, over to you, Haranthi. Thank you. Thank you again for your time. Thank you, James. I'm trying to share my screen. Okay. Um, so basically, um, um, I'm, I'm actually going to talk about um, this project that we we did. Um, it was we did it uh, we did the field work in 2014 to 2015, um, and it was funded by the Open Society Foundations. Um, and uh, the the findings that I'm going to talk about refer specifically to, to Sri Lanka. Um, okay, so. Um, so when you're talking about risks and vulnerability, um, it's very important to stress that these risks and vulnerability risks arise from the very beginning and throughout the entire migration cycle. So it's really important to consider each stage of the migration process. So pre-departure, the situation in the destination and also on return. And that's the focus that we had when we did this project. Um, and it's also important that um, both to know that both countries of origin and countries of destination are important in creating the circumstances of risk um, and vulnerability and what should be done to mitigate these risks. So you need to focus on, on both sides, not, you know, not just the receiving context. Um, so um, in that light, I just wanted to very quickly um, mention some of the main findings dividing it up into origin, destination and return. Um, so one of the first things that is that um, the most of the women uh, migrate for economic reasons and, and the levels of family poverty are, are very, very high um, in Sri Lanka. Um, and also some of them migrate also because of family problems, um, particularly um, abuse by family members, uh, domestic abuse. Um, so when you look at their health, so obviously the, um, the, circum the economic circumstances and um, abusive relationships all, all have impact on health even before they migrate. Um, at all stages of the pre-departure governing process, there are shortcomings in the, the prevention of risk to their health. So to take a few examples, um, so the standard contract design is too general. Um, there's too much um, unenforceable it's too much un un unenforceable in the in the destination countries and it's left to the employers really to 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 implement it um there is a welfare insurance scheme as there is in other other um, uh, origin countries uh which they pay into or the the agents pay agents pay into from the employers uh, money the employers send um it's limited and doesn't really cover health protection or access to healthcare in the destination countries. And it's also ambiguous about other things that, that it covers while they are um, in, in the uh, destination countries. Um, the pre-departure training focuses much more than it should on self-protection and self-help. So for instance, um, the women are advised to take medicines from home um, and the importance of kind of using mindfulness to, to alleviate stress. Um, and things like that, you know, not, not so much to seek healthcare. Um, and then there's, and this is something quite important that we found that during um, the medical testing process, uh, there's not enough information given to them. Uh, often they do not see the reports. I mean, they don't really know what's going on and how the actual health before they, uh, they leave a um, kind of impact on, on what happens when they, when they reach there. So in terms of the destination, much of what the vital science report brought out about living and working conditions and problems in access to healthcare in the Gulf countries, we also found in our research. 
So specifically for domestic workers, the, sort of the, the very poor living environment, lack of personal space, long hours, insufficient rest or paid leave, uh, even though that's mentioned in the contract. Um, the work was habitually involves heavy lifting and carrying, which leads to uh, musculoskeletal injury. Um, and then they had to use strong uh, cleaning agents, which create respiratory and eye problems. Um, and sometimes having to do other non-domestic uh, work, which is not specified in the contract, uh, which could result in exhaustion uh, and also other injuries like burning. We had some examples of that. Um, and healthcare access um, for physical ailments was provided at the discretion of the employer as is stipulated in the contract too. So it's extremely variable. Some employers were supportive, others totally ignored workers' illnesses. And also it wasn't very clear to the extent to which money was deducted from their pay for medical treatment. And that's something which I think, you know, it's, it's good to explore uh, further. Um, it's practically no access to mental health care. Um, emphasis was on, as I said before, on self-help. So they were encouraged to prayer and meditation and mindfulness. Um, other research also has shown that this risk associated with working and living conditions and access to health care were exacerbated during the pandemic. Um, the embassy staff that we interviewed said they tried to repatriate women who came to them after experiencing abuse by the employer, but again, this is variable. Um, and also the attitudes of the welfare officers weren't that, you know, were that, weren't that very positive about these things. Um, uh, and the, the women we interviewed were not that positive about embassy support, and these um, findings are corroborated in other research. Um, in terms of the return, um, and this is an area I'm actually really interested in, um, the, there is a state-run welfare and reception center near the airport, which receives women who seek help at the airport. Um, at the time of interview, they reported that among women who need who need a support and referral were those who are pregnant or with babies, and those with uh, health issues, including broken limbs, which resulted from attempted suicide or being pushed or from workplace accidents. Um, also, mental illness is far more reported by women than male returnees. Um, but these, the staff in this center also spoke about the stigma the women experience when they return to their families and communities, such as if they were pregnant or, or had, a, had a baby with them. Um, and the returners, returners we interviewed focused mostly on inadequate support uh, for long-term health problems. And this is really interesting because Quite often, they, there's a sort of circularity in the migration process. So a lot of the women who came back um, were going again. And they were said that you know, they had these health problems like backache and um, lung problems. And, and they were still going to go back because, because, um, because they, they returned to domestic work abroad for the same reasons that they left in the first place, which is economic reasons, uh, misuse of money by families, um, abuse, um, things like that. Um, so, yeah, so just a few um, sort of the recommendations that we made to, with reference to Sri Lanka. So basically, um, um, for the, most of the recommendations were for the country of origin. So basically to examine and address gaps and anomalies in the governance process, including the welfare insurance scheme and the contract. Um, inclusion, inclusion receiving um, countries uh, labor laws because you know they're tied in the CAFA system to employers and the labor laws, you know, most of them don't cover their work, uh, domestic work. Uh, and for this, of course, they have to work with the receiving countries and as part of the, uh, say, the Colombo process, the Abu Dhabi dialogue, and also with international organizations such as IOM and ILO, which are actually doing some work at the moment on research on, on, on the, at the moment on these conditions. Um, and then obviously all the other things I talked about, like pre departure processes like uh, training and testing and psychological support for returnees. Um, and the, another recommendation we had was to review and monitor implementation of action plans. And Sri Lanka has these plans like in other um, origin countries as a labor migration policy and a national migration health policy, which make very good points, but there's not enough evidence on how they're implemented, um, how the action points are implemented and how they're monitored, you know, how, how they're kind of you know, assessed. 
Um, and then finally, the, the last thing and very important is to ratify and implement the ILO Domestic Workers Convention, um, which ensures the labor and health rights of workers, both at home and abroad. And actually, of all the countries we are talking about now, um, the Gulf countries and um, sort of Asian countries, it's only Philippines that has, I think, ratified it so far. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's all I want to say very briefly. And if anybody's interested in the briefing and the report, you can find it at, um, at Compass and Oxford website. Thank you. Thank you, um, Haranti, uh, so much. That was really interesting. I, I particularly thought it was very useful, the, the, the kind of setting out of the, the different issues at different stages the, the, of the sort of migration cycle from through the origin state you know departure then through the employment phase and then the return um which is you know and the return i think is as you say probably the most neglected of, of any aspects of the migration cycle um well, just one one kind of one follow-up i had was we've been looking a little bit uh, as part of the vital science project at the fact that the gulf states you know are moving towards um the, 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 this sort of mandatory health insurance as a kind of solution um to some of the issues you know facing not just uh, uh migrant workers but also citizens um, and I wonder if you have any reflections on on the the implications of that for domestic workers, you know, whether those are positive or negative or, or somewhere in between. Yeah, um, I think because um, at the moment um, they're still tied to the employers. So uh, so it, it depends on whether these provisions for healthcare access are based on the employer um, or, or just on the workers themselves and to what extent the workers will have access to to this uh, health insurance card or insurance schemes um, if the kafala system does tie people to their um, employers and quite often employers at least when we were doing the research and even later i think uh, uh, they take their passport and they take all the documents um, so they have little um, sort of you know um, uh, what do you call it um, they, they can't agency to, to to do anything so so I think a lot depends on how these uh, schemes that they're moving towards um, how they work with in relation to the employers and the workers and and who is you know how they engage the workers to be independent um, so yeah Thank you. That's that's really um, helpful. Um, thank you, Haranthi. Um, over um, to our next speaker. Just before actually, I switch to our next speaker, um, Haranthi. If you're able to um, stop sharing your screen, I don't know if that's oh, possible. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. That's, no worries. No, no. Um, <laughs> wonderful. Thanks. Um, so just before I turn over, just to say that we, we there's been a couple of questions in the in the Q and A, which is great, and some hands up, and we will. We will definitely i think we're going to have time for proper discussion on that so we will we will come to you we haven't forgotten about you i'm going to put a couple of links in the in the chat as well um that may be useful just uh, that things that have come out of the the discussion so far um so over to our um next speaker um which is um and we're delighted to have mira al hussein um mira is a sociologist a social commentator and a postdoctoral researcher at the university of oxford um, she focuses on the socio-political changes in the Gulf states, and her research interests include social movements in the region, women's rights, migration and labour, authoritarianism and the post-oil transition. She's founder of the webinar series Tashirat Duhul, which hosts young academics and activists from the Gulf to discuss topics relevant to the Gulf Street. Um, Mira, welcome. Thank you. Over Thank to you. James. Thanks, everyone, whoever is attending. I want to preface by saying... I um, I'm sorry, I do not speak for migrants. I do not have the right to speak for migrants. So whatever I'm gonna say here is, is just a viewpoint, but it's not necessarily representative. And um, I think, I, think I, I, I would appreciate hearing about migrants from migrants themselves. Um, now, I, I wanna, um, if, if I can ask you, James, to kindly share um, the link so there's this link that James very kindly shared here, and um, this link has um, a video from the COVID sanitization program in the UAE. And this video, I found it very problematic when it first came out because it showed um, people in PPI sanitizing streets and sanitizing public transport, which is mainly used by um, migrant workers, basically. Um, the message 
th this video and this attitude was sending to everyone was that um, was was basically um, something that that is subconsciously accepted and internalized and almost never interrogated, which is that migrants are intrinsically unhealthy. Therefore, they cannot get um, unwell. They cannot be unwell because they are in intrinsically unhealthy and unwell. Um, they, they are resistant to being um, exhausted, to being affected by uh, the climate, to being affected by disease, which is why even in health insurance was introduced only very recently for domestic workers. Before, before I think 2015, domestic workers um, were not entitled to, um, or, or even for uh, employers, were not required to obtain health insurance for domestic workers. And now health insurance um, only covers very basic stuff. In fact, it, it hardly costs anything for an employer to get health insurance for domestic workers, which really tells you a lot about how much people value um, migrant workers and value their rights. I, I want to I wanna use an anecdote here, and this is not only about the Gulf. I'm, I think I've, I've experienced this attitude in different parts of the world, especially with Black Lives Matter and how um, um, women of color and people of color generally talk about their experiences going to see a GP and uh, a GP kind of uh, trivializing their pain and, their, and so forth. So um, I was listening to um, Salman Rushdie's uh, memoirs, um, Joseph Anton, and he describes an incident where he was with the BBC filming a documentary in India. And they were at a tailor's house and they were his guests and filming in his house. And then they were taking a break because it was really hot and they were drenched in sweat. And the production team um, offered everyone uh, cold drinks, um, a Coke, um, a Coke the drink, not Coke. And um, but but they they did not offer um, the tailor and his family anything at that point. Salman Rushdie gets up and he tells the, the the director that if this is not rectified, he's gonna uh, walk away. It's it's very interesting that this kind of pops out here and there. But this idea that they are not deserving or they're they're not in need even of any consideration because they're not affected by heat because this is their natural habitat this is their natural environment they don't have air conditioning back home they don't have these comforts they're not used to these comforts so why should we provide them with these comforts i remember having a discussion once when i saw a, a bus um, busing basically um, um, laborers in Dubai and um, it, it was really a very hot day and uh, it looks like that the bus did not, not have air conditioning because everyone had their windows down and they were wiping away the sweat and the person sitting on uh, sitting next to me in the passenger seat said do you know why they do this it's because if they bus them in comfortable air conditioned buses and ask them to get out in the heat and work they're, they're not going to be comfortable. It's the discomfort will will feel um, will be stark. They were, they're going to experience this transition very harshly. Whereas if you bus them in very uncomfortable conditions, getting off the bus and getting down to work might feel like a relief because now you're out in the breeze and open air. And and this this conversation was very problematic for me. And. But the problem is, and I'm going to end very soon, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm running um, uh, over, over my time, but the conversation around migrant workers in the Gulf is that they're always discussed in a security paradigm. I was looking up the other day, the chairman for the National um, um, Human Rights Institute, um, Maksud Cruz, who's supposed to be a half Emirati. And you, I, in my mind, I thought half Emirati, fantastic. They appointed someone who has a non-Emirati background, who maybe has a foot in both worlds and can understand and relate to different people. But then I realized, looking at his qualifications and background, that he comes from the army. He's he's a psychologist, but he's worked his entire life in the army. So this paradigm, this security paradigm, sort sort of overwhelms the conversation and the, and the out, or, uh, outlook in, in the Gulf and I think in, in the UAE. Yes, and thank you very much. And I'm done. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. That was really interesting. And, and I think um, 
anecdotes are always helpful to, helpful to bring out these themes in a uh, it's, it's, it's those are really really helpful and and I, I i i wanted to ask you you know we've discussed a lot of the challenges to migrant worker health and you know we talked about for example heat and pollution or you know very specific issues you know obviously distinct issues that affect domestic workers i, I guess i'm interested to, to what extent you know our gulf nationals in your view and i realize you can't speak for everyone but are, are there shared interests in solving those challenges or you know are people in a way insulated you know barack flagged you know that that, that when there's a, a, a dusty day in kuwait that has a major impact on the health of migrants it appears to have less of an impact on the lives of kuwaitis so uh, do you think do you see there being some shared challenges that can be collectively tackled or are people's experiences so different you know distinct because of their different status that it's quite hard to get that that shared agency i think james we could give people the benefit of the doubt when it comes to migrant workers because they're isolated they live in in camps very far away from the city and they're often working all the time even during weekends sometimes so people don't actually see them and the very few instances where they um kind of um, make an appearance in a, in a public space or a mall, they're suddenly, they, they stand out. Uh, but what, what, is, what is the excuse when it comes to domestic workers who live with you at home and they're relegated to these uh, very, very tight, inhumane, windowless quarters? And every time the conversation comes up, and I've seen this in my family too, um, there's always the, 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 this negation of uh, the need for comfort, because why do they need what they never had? They're used to this. This is luxury for them. What we offer them is luxury. A bed is a luxury because they, they, the idea is they sleep on the floor. And I think this is where, where the, these kind of stereotypes or stories that are supposed to kind of um, um, release people, absolve them from guilt or to have to kind of relate uh, or re reflect on how they treat other people, kind of, we, we need to kind of um, ask these questions where, where who, who is promoting this discourse? What can we do about this? What, what are the, um, I think it's, it's important to engage universities, higher education, schools, we're always looking at human rights organizations, we're always looking at government, we're not looking at civil society, we're not looking at the, the people, people to people level, and there's no civil society in many countries of the Gulf. But then where's education? Education is dominated by non um, Khalijis, they run these institutions. So why aren't they engaged? Why don't we have them on board to kind of do their part, if you will? Thank you. That's, I mean, big, big issues. And often this does come back to these really big, big questions. Um, thank you, Mira. And thanks. Thanks, everyone. Um, so we have about fifth, just over 15 minutes for a discussion. I want to bring actually all could I bring all of our panelists back in if you could all just get your cameras back on. Um, I, I wanted to ask you all sort of one broad question and then we, 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 we might sort of turn to some of the questions that have been raised. Um, in the group, the first thing I, I Mira is it was the only only person actually to specifically flag COVID nineteen, and I I want I guess because we we, we feel like it, it's almost feeling like the past now, but of course it is still with us. I wanted to ask, you know, given this is the biggest health crisis that's faced the world in in you know at least a generation, if not much more. Um, what has that shown us, and 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 what's what have been its effects, and it's you know what has it shown us about the health of migrant workers in the Gulf. What, what did you what 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 did people observe? Um, I'm I'm going to start if it makes sense with with you, Barak, because just because I think you actually have done some research on this. Yeah, unfortunately, um, I I think the intervention that the government did, whether it's intentional or not, really worsened the cases of migrant workers getting COVID-19 first, and then it also worsened the overall outcome in terms of excess deaths. So we found that for the non-Kuwaitis, the excess deaths were about 73%. For the Kuwaitis, it was about only uh, in, the, in the 
20s, uh, 24 or 25%. So there was a huge difference between the number of lives lost during the pandemic year of 2020 compared to, to um, the previous average of the five years or so. But there's also the transmission of disease. So the R reproductive uh, uh, number of this is how much uh, transmission is happening usually goes down when there is a lockdown, right? So you, you get the R number to be below one. So that means the pandemic or the epidemic is just reducing in terms of transmission. What happened is that for the non coities because they're clustered in certain geographical areas, the lockdown increased the reproductive number and it was decreased for Kuwaiti. So you see health disparities across the board, anywhere you look, COVID or not. What was even you know, adding uh, insult to injury was when the vaccines uh, were started to get rolled out, we got the government to decide we're gonna give priority to Kuwaitis over non-Kuwaitis, which was another blow to this entire process of being discriminated against. Thank you, Barak. Great, great start to that. Does anyone else want to offer any, any observations on, on COVID-19? Um, I, I actually did mention very, very quickly the, <laughs> Sorry. The, 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 the way the living and working conditions were made much worse. Um, I mean, I didn't actually do any sort of primary research during the pandemic, but I was reading, um, you know, other people's research and, and Sri Lanka was, um, uh, most of the research came from a time when Sri Lanka didn't have a very high COVID rates, but they were trying to get back some of the workers, um, particularly domestic workers who were in the in the, in the Gulf countries. Um, I think apart from the, um, the kind of, you know, high rates of infection, everything that we talked about, um, uh, and, and the working and the living conditions, which actually made it much worse and more isolated and uh, and more difficult to access healthcare, and that was recorded in the in the research that I've read about. Um, also, there was this amnesty in some countries given to to workers who uh, were un, un, um, un, um, uh, you know not uh, not considered to be well irregular migrants, um, and they were herded into these camps. Um, and there was a you know widespread of infection there and really poor conditions. So um, uh, some of the people who came back to Sri Lanka were brought back uh, um, uh, to to Sri Lanka um, were infected and they had to go to special you know sort of quarantine centers and and there was a lot of uh, public um, outcry about that and how they were spreading infection and um, so that was one way in which uh, you know people coming back returnees were sort of negatively uh, affected. Um, so. Thank you, Ranthi. And just, to, just one thing to flag, um, there's some great work on this also by the Kuwaiti researcher Sharifa Al-Shalfan, um, who's done some tremendous work in, in the Kuwaiti context as well as Barak. Neera, did you want to, to say anything before I, I'm going to move otherwise to a question from the from the from the group? Did you want to make any further comment? No. Okay, great. Well, I, so so we've had two questions in the Q and A, and I'll I'll take them together. Um, I, I want, by the way, to make sure we leave time for a proper discussion about the way forward. How can we tackle these? How can people work together? Just to make sure to get everyone's perspective on that. But ju just so before we do that. We had one question from um, from Mariam asking, how can policies be pushed for better circumstances for migrant workers when there's such negative anti-migrant rhetoric from both government and the public? Really interesting discussion point. Uh, and then Usman has asked, particularly about what, what do we know? Do we know anything about the healthcare for um, people in, in detention in the GCC? Um, and you know, he's flagging, particularly in Saudi Arabia, there are um, because of the larger numbers there, um, and 1,600 Indians held in Saudi Arabian jails. Um, so does anyone want to, 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 to take a go at answering either of those questions? Mira, did you want to say anything about the, 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 the negative rhetoric? Um, I, I'm just going to um, um, say that we tend to rely on government, and I think sometimes government can be a reflection of 
the, the discourse that's prevalent in society anyway. So it, it doesn't necessarily have to stem from top bottom, it can be bottom up, because at the end of the day, those who work in government are ordinary people. Those who, who create these um, these uh, footages and, and publicity kind of videos and stuff like that, they are just ordinary people, I suppose. And one has to interrogate that kind of discourse and not just the government. So it's not always the government. Maybe ask, why do you have such views and where, where is this coming from? Probably from your schools and universities that don't address these kind of um, disparities and and issues. Yes, the role of education again. Um, if others are thinking about, oh, Nick, did you want to? Yeah, it's it's sort of Mariam's, um, and also. Um, but what Mira was talking about, I mean, I, I, remember I worked in the Gulf, I worked in Abu Dhabi between 2002 and 2006. One, in fact, one of the incidents that got me interested in migrant workers' rights was being at the Meridian Hotel in Abu Dhabi, surrounded by expatriates, and there's a beach at this hotel, and everyone was ordering drinks from an Indian, wait, an Indian waiter who was running around, and he was wearing very thick black sort of polyester trousers. And I remember asking him, could you not, could you not ask to wear shorts <laughs> and and he just he just sort of looked at us as if we were mad you know but i remember looking at everyone else and mostly expatriates and no one seemed to care about this guy who was clearly who was suffering from this heat and, and he was clearly not dressed appropriately for it and you know the, the things you're talking about um um mira and, and the question from mariam about can you know when when the attitude toward migrants is so negative, can you can you hope to to make progress? When we work on these issues and very technical issues like heat and humidity, or indeed kafala, you know, and we try to push kafala reform, the thing that I often come back to and that concerns me is that until there is a way to address discrimination, whether it's top down, bottom up, uh, I, I do have concerns that. Um, that 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 a lot of this work will be for naught until there is a groundswell movement um, in the Gulf that involves all nationalities, not just Khalijis, but involves expatriates as well, uh, to, to actually recognise that, that these workers deserve rights because they are human beings. And, and often that, that is lost in the conversation and it undermines all the work that, that we try to do. Sorry, just a, a slightly pessimistic point in response to a couple of point, uh, questions. Um. I'm going to, to, I don't know whether anyone, I mean, my, my on just on Usman's question, uh, I don't know whether anyone had any insights they wanted to share, but I suspect Usman, I mean, the, the best reporting I've seen on that was in the context of COVID, you know, and particularly the de deportation centers in Saudi Arabia. There was some reporting also on Qatar on the conditions there. Um, but I think overall, I would, I would suspect that our information level is, is not good enough on that. And I think that probably highlights a, a research gap and a, um, but I don't know if others others want to add anything on on that point. Very good paper on issue by Pardis Madavi, um, talking about um, the incarceration of of females, typically many of whom whom give birth um, and either have babies in jail or or not. So it's a, it's a not directly addressing that issue, Usman, but but there is uh, there is some very interesting research on it. Uh, it probably it is definitely under research, I would say though. But Pardis Madavi's paper is is very good on that. So just just taking the, 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 we've got a few more minutes left, sort of five more minutes, and I guess I want to just take this this opportunity to kind of yeah look looking forward at you know uh, how these issues can be addressed, and we've touched on that to some extent. Um, and I mean, it's interesting. I think one of the reasons that we wanted to obviously have this discussion was to think about, OK, how can I can can there be, you know, better and more productive conversations between, you know, people external to the Gulf and those within the Gulf living in the Gulf, Gulf citizens about how to tackle these issues that links in very much, I think, with with a, a question we've had from Jeffrey Martin, you know, asking how can we empower, empower migrant workers themselves to allow them to advocate you know, depend on themselves for their for their own health. So I'd be interested, you know, generally to ask the panel, you know, what do we think are the kind of key, the key things that need to happen to start addressing the concerns that we're raising here? Is this about is this about governments and in you know is it destination or origin states? 
is it is it about citizens is it about finding ways of of uh, empowering migrant workers and i'd be maybe I, we'll go through you know one by one um maybe we can go without putting too much pressure on you mira perhaps we can go in reverse order of the of the panelists <laughs> Um, I don't really have much to say, but I think there's there's a lot of optic erasure that happens a lot of the time. I've even had this happen with tourists and friends who visit and we'd be driving past people working in the heat and they would not see it. And I don't know if they don't want to see it or or this is just something that they that they're used to. And this this something might might be something that happens everywhere around the world. And we just focus on the Gulf and think that it only happens there. But then I've I've always wondered why aren't there billboards that project these? The you anyone can go and and rent a billboard. So where are these organizations that rent billboards to kind of highlight migrant workers? contribution, their health, it doesn't have to always be negative, just celebrate these people, D do not erase them from from the from from the Gulf, they are part of the Gulf, they're almost always erased. There's a token appreciation when you enter the um, uh, Burj Khalifa, that you've got this wall of appreciation, you've got pictures of people who built the wall, but not pictures of people who died while building the, 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 the Burj. So I guess we can, there is space to kind of um, inject very difficult conversations and have them, but um, I think I'm, I'm not going to say it's any particular um, um, you know uh, community's job to do that, but because the expats are the largest demographic in the Gulf, especially South Asians, I think it's important to talk about South Asians not just the wealthy ones who own businesses, but also the ones who are not. And I think this is an important conversation to, to draw in everybody to talk about their compatriots. So just like we want to talk about Gulf people talking about Gulf uh, issues, we want South Asians from all strata of society talking about South Asians. Really lots of food for thought thank you mira i think we're i think if we if each person can sort of you know speak for two minutes or so like mira did that will go very slightly over our, our hour but hopefully people can um stay around for for a couple more minutes um haranthi um any thoughts from you to, to close us um yeah so uh, one of the recommendations we had about um increasing sort of the voice of the migrant workers is to i mean these are also probably more the origin um countries is to to increase their representation in, say, the um, the the Bureau of Foreign Employment, um, there aren't any at the moment, uh, on the migrant resource centers in in um, destination countries, so that they have more of a, a sort of say in the decision making um, about you know what what they can um, you know to improve their situation um, in in both in the 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 sending and the receiving context and to ensure their voice is heard. Um, that's one way I think we, you know, could could um, improve their situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for for keeping to that time limit. I put <laughs> um, uh, Barack over to you. Yeah, just quickly. I don't think I I know everything or I know anything about advocacy and and politics and social science, but that's why it's important to have people from different disciplines talk to each other and and we can empower each other so that we can deliver this message and and then help migrant workers uh, also um, talk about these issues and advocate for themselves and i i like to talk to people in politics i like to talk to people in social science and human rights and uh, and also people in in uh, epidemiology and science and public health Right. Yes. The interdisciplinary conversation is so valuable um, and that should continue. Let, let, let's hope we can all continue that. Thank you. Um, Nick, over to you for a final final word and then we'll, we'll close. Oh, sure. I mean, I'm a human rights campaigner, so the, the approach I take to it probably won't surprise anyone, uh, you know, in, in reference to how to empower migrant workers. Well, I would say that migrant workers have been disempowered by by policy. Uh, and, and it's up to us to, to make convincing cases to the right stakeholders for positive and progressive policies. And that's difficult.
because of the structural forces that I think that are arrayed against us in this regard. Uh, but yeah, that's that's how I so I tend to approach it. Um, although I, you know, it's great to hear from. I, I like what Barack says about the interdisciplinary approach and how how important that is. And of course, it is, you know, as Mira says, vital that that you bring um, you bring all segments of society into this discussion um, because that's the only way that you'll ever make progress. Thank you, Nick, um, and thank you, everyone. Thanks to, for the, to the panelists for, for your fantastic contributions. Thank you for the questions from the attendees. Just to, just to flag a little plug is that our second report under the Vital Signs Partnership will be coming out in November. It will focus specifically on access to health, uh, and there will be um, new research from um, from you know various countries in the Gulf uh, that will hopefully again shed light on some of the the sort of emerging issues that we have found so thank you everybody and um have a great day and uh please stay in touch all the best thanks everyone